Oh, okay. Well, we're going to see how that turns out. It sounds like an adventure to me. In the meantime, today we're going to talk about Don Quixote and his adventures. <laughs> you know, uh, Don Quixote always kind of reminds me of a comic book. <laughs> it's so funny and hilarious. And, you know, I, I don't think that I've showed us <clears throat> some of these famous paintings that you'll see with Don Quixote in the Ormsby translation. Gustav Doré is a famous artist from back in the day. Uh, and let me share this screen with you here, my friends who are online. <clears throat> Any famously illustrated Don Quixote. I've already shown you this picture of Don Quixote going mad with all of the knights and things who are surrounding him. But let's think about, you know, what he looked like in some other instances, according to Gustav Doré and his imagination. Uh, So in the case of whenever he, we've already seen the windmills, right? Uh, let's see what he looked like when he went out. Here we have Don Quixote facing all kinds of little crazy things going around and somebody sweeping them away. Here we have Don Quixote sallying against uh, the Basque, uh, and uh, there is the lady who he thinks is in trouble here, and Sancho saying, no, don't go against them. You can see how hobbled Rocinante looks in that picture there. Here we have Don Quixote going against the windmill, and Sancho in the background, what are you doing? <laughs> Sancho, poor Don Quixote lying on the ground, and Sancho finding him, trying to help him out. And laying him across his horse, we see Sancho. Uh, here we have the valiant battle between Don Quixote and the Basque who holds up his pillow and armor and, and Sancho praying for Don Quixote's goodwill. Uh, <clears throat> here we have both of them beaten and battered and lying and exhausted. Here we have them among the goat herds as they're singing to them uh, and eating some acorns. And Don Quixote tells stories uh, to the goat herds there. It's really interesting to see how Sancho is taking care of the poor, withered Don Quixote. You see the way he looks. He's so withered and battered. He's almost physically dead in the way that he's portrayed by Gustav Doré. And it makes you see the pity that Sancho has for the poor man uh, and taking care of him. So paint pictures like that from Gustav Doré kind of, for me at least, help you to see a lot better how to imagine this character. Some of the chapters we're going to talk about today, we're talking about chapter 15. Uh, <clears throat> and in that chapter, we see Don Quixote and Rosanante and uh, Sancho drinking from a wild stream. Uh, we see them fighting off evil characters, and beaten again and battered. <laughs> Poor Don Quixote. Time and time again. Another chapter we're going to look at. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how... Uh, hmm. Don Quixote frees these prisoners uh, who are chained, in this case here, uh, who he sees as being, you know, treated poorly. And then they turn on him and throw stones at him at the end after he frees them. Hmm. Of course, book two as well, taking a look at that book and seeing how Gustav Doré portrayed that. One thing that would be cool to me to look at uh, would be... Uh, Dulcinea and what she looks like. Here we got Dulcinea. Doesn't quite look like what Don Quixote had imagined there. Not quite the princely, princessly beauty in that sense there. <clears throat> so it's interesting to take a look at some of these pictures and see how he's been portrayed as well. 
Let's take a look at how Don Quixote progresses and how Sancho progresses, if you can call it progresses, uh, throughout this work of literature, because they don't just stay the same the whole time. It's interesting to know especially how they change as we move toward book two. Uh, we're at chapter 15 right now, still in book one here. Uh, So one of the things that happens to Don Quixote, Don Quixote keeps getting beaten up and battered, and he has to kind of keep reinventing reasons and uh, why he thinks that this is happening to him. And Sancho explains, well, maybe you broke the laws of chivalry, and so the god of battles is punishing you. Maybe that's why you're suffering through these things, rather than you're absolutely insane and you're going up against these people, uh, you know, who are obviously, you know, seeing you as that way and putting you in your place, but he has to maintain this illusion. And Sancho is buying into it in this sense right here. Sancho is playing into uh, his illusion by telling him this right here. That's exactly what Don Quixote wanted to be. We see that the victory that he had over the Basque makes him arrogant. Look at how arrogant he becomes now that he's had the victory over the Basque. Uh, and he says, I'm going to fight more people. I'm going to do more of this here. And Sancho, we see how he contrasts with Don Quixote and not wanting uh, to have a fight and stuff like that. Don, uh, Sancho says, I'm a peaceful man, mild and meek. I can overlook any insult because I've got a wife to support and children to bring up. Uh, <clears throat> you bear this in mind. I'm not going to draw my sword against anybody. I'm going to forgive all fronts. Uh, no matter who they are. Now, with Sancho, I don't think that this is supposed to show, you know, uh, Sancho, as we see her here, has no understanding or courage in that case right there. So he is the perennial coward, and we love him because of it. So that's one of the things about Sancho Panza. Anytime that Don Quixote goes up and tries to get in a battle or whatever, Sancho's like, whoa, I'm staying back here, you know. And the books that Don Quixote has read and a lot of these famous books that we've read in the past, we see that courage is privileged. People who are going out and being courageous and all of these things are shown to be heroes. But Sancho Panzo is a hero in his own right, and we love him in his own right because he's a coward. So coward is an endearing concept in a lot of ways. It's one of the things you can derive from analyzing Sancho Panza. Uh, cowardice. Uh, in Don Quixote, we see some of his views about nobility, and I think it's important since he is himself a noble, uh, and I think this compares with a lot of the other stories that we've read. This is on page 174. Uh, Don Quixote says on that page, he says, there are two kinds of lineage in this world, those that spring from princes and monarchs, and that time is gradually destroyed. Uh, so nobility of birth, uh, and then there's this idea of those who are lowborn and upside down, and they begin to rise up little by little by the their actions. So this is similar to what was discussed in the Decameron right there, this idea of undermining the fact that nobility comes from birth and arguing that nobility comes from uh actually our deeds and stuff like that. So Don Quixote himself is trying to make himself noble through his actions and through his deeds. I think that we've seen many times. Uh, so he doesn't favor that traditional hierarchical concept. Another thing to think about when we think about this particular passage here on 174 is the fact that uh, it's really important to note that Don Quixote has just told Sancho Panza who Dulcinea is. He says, this is Dulcinea. And Sancho Panza says, oh, I know her. She's a hardy peasant with all kinds of muscles. She can pick up anything in the world. She can fight and joke and fart with the best man around. Uh, <clears throat> and Don Quixote is like, oh. <laughs> He's like, no, because she's a peasant girl, you know. And Don Quixote's like, well, you know what? He says, 
that he gives this explanation right here. He says that uh, there's all kinds of lineage. She can be a princess if she wants to be based on her actions. Uh, another thing to note about how he explains away this idea uh, is hmm, later on that he says that she can be as beautiful as I want her to be in my imagination because my imagination is more powerful than reality itself. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm going to touch on that in just a moment. Uh, before I get there, uh, let's talk about this chapter 22 that I ask you to read in book one as well. Uh, this chapter 22 talks about Don Quixote freeing uh, these criminals from this situation that they're in, in chained uh, and they're going on to take, be taken to the galleys to another prison, basically, in other words. And there's this idea of justice uh, and Don Quixote presenting his own personal justice versus what society sees as justice. So time and time again, if you want to characterize Don Quixote, he's got this autonomous sense. He... Uh, his individuality is supposed to trump society in that sense. So uh, he sees these people enchained, and Don Quixote says, I need to free these people. Uh, and Sancho, as always, talks good sense to him. He says, so Don Quixote says, this situation is calling out for the exercise of my profession, the redressing of outrages, and the succor of the relief of the wretched. Again, we see... This is his calling, and he's trying to live up to the calling, which seems good on the surface of things. But Sancho talks common sense. He reminds him of reality. He says, this situation, I'm sorry, justice, and that means the king himself isn't doing these people any outrage, only punishing for them for their crimes. So there's this sense of society sense of justice versus a personal sense of justice here going on. Uh, and they are... It should be noted that prisoners were treated very, very harshly in this day and time. It was very common for prisoners to die uh, very quickly within, you know, the prison system in that day and age. Uh, it's even said in this very chapter, there was one prisoner who was sentenced to 10 years hard labor, and they said he might, it might as well be a death sentence. So, you know, 10 years in our prison system might not mean a dis death sentence, but uh, well, maybe in Mississippi's prison system it might, but uh, in, in other areas of the country, uh, it doesn't usually mean a death sentence. Uh, but in this day and time, it pretty much was. And it should be noted that Cervantes himself spent a lot of time in prison. Okay, so uh, in a lot of ways, Don Quixote has sympathy for these people that nobody else in society has for. And so that presents him as, you know, having a heart that in a lot of ways, is more empathetic than, than, than most people. <clears throat> uh, and, and of course, Don Quixote always values independence. Uh, and he asks these prisoners, instead of listening to what his, their captors say about them and why they're there, he wants to hear firsthand their stories. And they all give stories, mostly sad stories, that he misunderstands basically, uh, <clears throat> and Don Quixote tries to defend them. <clears throat> because, as I say right here, he reacts to the emotional rather than the rational. And Don Quixote says, these people shouldn't be in prison, for our free will is sovereign. There's no herb or enchantment that can control it. Uh, <clears throat> He says right here, this is the important passage, I think, on page 183. He stops and he tells the sergeant to stop, uh, to let these people go, right here. Uh, from everything you've told me, he says, uh, although it is for your crimes you've been in sentence, the punishments you are to suffer give you little pleasure and that you're on your way to receive them with re reluctance and against your will. And it could be that one man's lack of courage under tor torture, another's lack of money, another's lack of strings to pull, and to be brief, the judge's perverse decisions were the causes of your downfall, of his failure to recognize the right was on your side. 
uh, now I need to go off and exercise chivalry. Uh, and I vow to favor the needy and those oppressed by the powerful. And Don Quixote continues, it does seem excessively harsh to make slaves of those whom God and nature made free. These poor men have done nothing to you, guards, so let each of them answer for their sins in the other world. There is a God in heaven who does not neglect to punish the wicked and reward the virtuous. It's not right for honorable men to be the executioners of others if they have no personal concern in the matter. And so he says, either you need to let them go or I'm going to make you let them go with the force of my arms. So this explanation by Don Quixote on page 183 of why he sets these criminals free uh, and in turn, ironically, Don Quixote becomes a criminal by setting the criminals free uh, in this sense here, and he thinks he's doing the right thing. Uh, his explanation is that uh, a people should not be the captors of other people. People should not make other people do things that they don't want to do and, and govern their reality. People have this sense of autonomy that's been given to them by God, and they shouldn't be forced to see the world in a way that society says they should see it or to live their lives in chains. They should be given freedom and free will because that's how God gave them. And people shouldn't enforce punishment on others and enforce people to be slaves or to be prisoners and things such as that. They shouldn't enforce justice because either God should enforce justice or people who are acting on the codes of chivalry in the case of Don Quixote should enforce justice. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a really interesting argument right there, and we see some of the underlying themes of this work have to do with autonomy and individuality and perspectivism in relation to what is truly just and what is truly true, what is tr real reality, all of these things. All of these ideas come to play in this very scene right here where he sets the captives free. All of that is analogous to the very thing that Don Quixote is going on with his imagination. Everybody he runs into tries to imprison him in their reality, but Don Quixote says, no, I'm free. I have my own reality to live. And he constantly asserts his own autonomy in the face of, of societal rules. But little good it does him. All of this corresponds to the same thing that happens to him anytime he says that I'm free to live my own life. I'm free to live my own reality. Uh, even if it's wrong, according to you, he gets beaten into the dirt. Time and time again, he's faced with the violence of reality. He's faced with the fact that other people want to enforce their reality upon others. Uh, and he's also face to face with the fact that Don Quixote thinks there's karma. If you do good things for people, then they will return those good things back to you. That's his moral code. But these criminals do not live by that moral code. And so again, another mistake of Don Quixote is believing that the whole world operates on the same moral code that he does in acting in that way. He's expecting rewards, but he does not receive them. Instead, his rewards are stones. So reality itself, the world in which we live in, is an unfair place. Uh, and I think that that corresponds to the Decameron as well. Okay, so they're left, of course, again, beaten and battered uh, by people, in this case, who they're trying to help, the criminals. They turn on them. Uh, <clears throat> so Sancho, again, tries to tell Don Quixote that he needs to do the sensible thing, and we need to run because the Holy Brotherhood is going to go out and is going to you know, murder us where we stand, right there, uh, once they find out what you've done, because now you're a criminal. Now, Don Quixote begins to change in this part right here, because this is the first time that he starts to listen to Sancho's sense. Uh, Sancho says, hey, we need to get out of here, okay? 
And it's like finally the beatings start to get through Don Quixote's head. And Quixote says, you're a coward by nature, Sancho, yet to prevent you from claiming I'm obstinate, never do as you recommend. Just this once, I'll take your advice and keep my distance. And I'm going to run away. But on one condition, you take the blame for it. <laughs> it's you that I'm doing it for, not for somebody else, and not because I'm a coward. Uh, so it's really interesting that Sancho, in this case here, his common sense is a type of wisdom. Uh, and Don Quixote is starting to listen to it. He goes out into the wilderness, into the mountains, just like an outlaw, and he's happy to do this right here. It's, it gives him a lot of joy because he knows that this is the type of place that he's read about in his books. This is the type of place where he can create his fiction that he wishes to live. So yes, now I'm going to talk about a couple of passages where Dulcinea is presented in reality and how Don Quixote reacts to that real, present, real presentation of Dulcinea. Anytime that Don Quixote runs into a reality that doesn't mesh with his idea of what the world should be like, he finds a way to rationalize it. He finds a way to keep his uh, imagination and his idea of what the world is like intact without accepting that something is different. So, and that happens in the case of Dul Dulcinea in two places in this narrative. The first place is in book one, and I've already told you about it. Uh, this passage is on 214, uh, and this is where Don, Don Quixote is, and, and Sancho are conversing about what Dulcinea is like in reality. Uh, you see how strong, she's strong as an ox right here. Uh, she's got muscles on top of muscles, uh, <clears throat> things like that. And she's not going to understand all these things that you're telling her. Uh, <clears throat> so, instead of acknowledging that Dulcinea is, you know, not something that he imagined she is, he says, explains to Sancho, and I think this is an important passage on 2.16, he says, for what I want of Dulcinea till Toboso, she is as good as the most exalted princess in the princess in the world. Yet indeed, for not all poets who praise ladies under a name they choose for them really have any mistress at all. Do you really believe that the Phyllises and Sylvias and Dianas and Galateas and all the others that fill the books and ballads and barber shops and flesh and blood? and the mistresses of those that praise and appraise them? No, of course not. The poets themselves invent most of them to have something to write about and to make people think that they're in love and that they have it in them to be their lovers. This is a really fascinating passage because it's one of the few passages wherein Don Quixote acknowledges that the books that he's been reading are not real in this sense right here. He acknowledges that he's reading... Uh, these books and that these characters in the books have been invented by the poets in order to make their poetry. Uh, and so there's an argument whenever you interpret this work, there's a lot of people who argue and say, well, some people say Don Quixote knows it's all a fiction and goes on with it anyway, and other people say, no, he doesn't. And then other people say he gradually learns or he hems and haws. There's scenes like this right here uh, that explain, in any case, there's scenes like th here that explain why, even if he believes it's all a falsity, he thinks that he should keep doing this uh, and, and keep up his imagination whether the, rather than what everybody says is real. He says... To put it in a nutshell, I imagine that everything I say is precisely as I say it is, and I depict her in my imagination as I wish her to be, both in beauty and in rank, 
and Helen of Troy cannot rival her, nor can Lucretia or any other famous woman of the past equal her. And people can say what they like, because if I'm reproached by the ignorant for this, I shall not be punished by even the most severe judges. So that's what I was talking about. I think this is a key passage. It's on page 216 when you talk about the power of imagination in this work right here. Don Quixote acknowledges that maybe Dulcinea in reality isn't what I say she is, but because in my imagination, I, I make her to be this way. My imagination is stronger than reality itself. Uh, so what I say in my imagination is precisely as I want it to be because I imagine it to be that way and because of my perseverance. Okay, <clears throat> now let's finally... My batteries went dead. How you doing back there, Brooklyn? How far along are you on your um, story? It's done. Who ended up being the bad guy? Didn't have a bad guy in the end. Hello, my friends. Sorry, folks online. Not sure where I lost you, but just a couple minutes ago, it sounds like. Okay, so we were in book two, uh, and I was establishing where we were in reality that this book had in the real world in which we live in, that the book had been sold and was made famous. And everybody had read about uh, the things that happened to Don Quixote. So Cervantes published another uh, book, a sequel to Don Quixote, and now that's what we're reading. And in the sequel, it picks up not too far after the events. But what's interesting is that Don Quixote learns that somebody's been writing this book about him. And the story itself, he learns that somebody's been writing this book about him, this Moorish fellow, Said Hammock Benengali. Uh, <clears throat> well, Cervantes, as retold by that guy. Uh, <clears throat> and Don Quixote's been, of course, he got back from his second sally, he got beat up again, and now he's waking up. But the difference is that it sounds like at the beginning that he sounds well-reasoned and eloquently expressed. 
And so the priest, his friend, and the barber are talking to him, and they're trying to see if he's still crazy or not. And Don Quixote spoke with such good sense about every subject they discussed that they reached the conclusion he was fully recovered. Yet it only takes a minute for them to realize that he still believes that knights errant are a thing. But in this book, this idea becomes complicated. Don Quixote's madness becomes more complicated in this book, and it almost seems like perhaps he knows what he's talking about, and it, his much madness makes good sense, is a paraphrase of uh, Shakespeare. And it kind of works in this case here. They're talking about all the bad things that are going on in society, all the ways in which the king is facing all of these Turkish forces going to destroy them and all of these corruption and government and everything. And Don Quixote says all the majesty has to do is call up the honorable knights errant and they'll fix all the problems, you know. And in some ways it makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> that's what he says right here at the top of 489. Uh, <clears throat> He says, well, actually, page 490. He says, uh, <clears throat> he says, if we could call up some of these knights errants, they will fix all the problem. And he believes and has faith in God caring for his people and provides someone who is not as ferocious as the knights errant of old, at least not as inferior in spirit. And so Don Quixote thinks that he is going to go out and fix all of these problems that the king faces. Uh, and the priest gives an explanation. Uh, the priest, sensing that Don Quixote is crazy, tells Don Quixote a story in order to convince him that what he's doing is insane. He talks about this madman uh, in the Seville madhouse uh, who, you know, everybody thought that he was crazy, but then one guy far off heard that he might be not crazy. And he comes to him, and he almost convinces him that he's not crazy. But there at the end, he thinks that, oh, uh, you know, he's the son of Jupiter uh, in this sense right here. So obviously, he's crazy. Uh Well, actually, he is Jupiter himself, is what he thinks. Uh, and Don Quixote responds to this tale. He understands what the priest is saying. He understands that the priest is saying, you're crazy, dude. You go out here, you're going to do all this stuff. You're going to act crazy, right? Don Quixote says, I'm not like that guy. This man is blind. Okay, you can't see further in his notes. Uh, he says, I, Mr. Barber, am not Neptune, the god of water, nor am I a madman trying to make people believe me sane. I'm merely striving to make the world understand the delusion under which it labors and not renewing within itself those most happy days when the order of knight errantry carried all before. Hmm. So what he's saying is, is, he says, I know I'm not crazy. I know that the world is crazy for not bringing these knights back, and I'm the only one who's sane for wanting to bring these knights back into reality. He says, but these depraved times of ours don't deserve those benefits. Uh, and he, he characterizes knights errant uh, as people who are helping others in all of these ways. He says, there's nobody out there to help us, and so that's why the world is in such a sad state. <clears throat> okay, moving on to chapter 2 here. We see Sancho Panza introduced again after the, all this time. Uh, <clears throat> and there, there's a discussion between he and the housekeeper as to whether he is the one that makes... Uh, Don Quixote go off, or whether it's Don Quixote is the one who makes Sancho Panza crazy. Sancho says, I'm the one who's been taken off and led astray, not your master. He's the one who took me traipsing around. Uh, 
Uh, and we see this idea from the priest on 498 where it talks about anyone who'd think they've been made in the same old that the madness of the master wouldn't be worth a farthing without the foolishness of man. So he provides a perspective saying that these two aren't, uh, aren't the same without one another. The madness of each of them depends upon one another to confirm it, play off of it. There's, again, this idea when we're talking about Sancho Panza and Don Quixote and their character it, about how they do all of these things together, how the master and the servant are equal in a lot of ways. Together we left home. This is in Sancho's words, uh, well, Don Quixote's words. He says, together we left home. Together we sallied forth. Together we went on our pilgrimage. We shared the same fortune and the same fate. And if you were blanket tossed once, I was rib basted a thousand times. Uh, so there's this idea of togetherness between these two uh, that kind of persists and kind of helps them through their problems. So you could talk about friendship in the case of this work right here. You could talk about how friendship helps people through tough moments and how togetherness uh, kind of helps people through problems, and I think you could connect that to the Epic of Gilgamesh, perhaps. Now, this is where the narrative complicates in the way that I was talking about. Don Quixote, waking up, says, Hey, Sancho, I want you to tell me about what everybody is saying about me. Tell me about the fame and the experience I've been having. What have been people in the village been saying about my great deeds? And he says, Tell me truthfully, Sancho. And of course, Sancho does tell him truthfully because he's so simple. He can't really, in, well, he can invent lies, we learn later. Uh, but he gives him the unvarnished truth. He says, well, uh, as long as you don't get mad at me, the reality is the common people say you're a raging lunatic, and I'm no better. He says, the Hidalgos is saying you go beyond the proper limits and calling yourself a Don. And the Dons, the nobility, are saying you need to not try to rival us. So nobody's happy with him. Nobody thinks he's great. Uh, Don Quixote resists reality again. He says, none of that could possibly refer to me. Uh, <clears throat> And everybody talking about your valor, everybody else says you're mad but funny, brave but unlucky, polite but a meddler. <clears throat> and Don Quixote explains away reality again. He says he compares himself to other great people, Alexander, Hercules, Julius Caesar, Amadeus of Gaul, and says everybody criticized them, they're going to criticize me. Then on page 501 in chapter 2, we learn, Sancho says, hey, there's been this book written called The Ingenious Hidalgo, Don Quixote de la Mancha, right here. And in it, they tell everything that's happened to us. I think this is an essential passage right here when he first learns the fact that somebody's written a book about him in the book itself. Uh, and, and it says, we've learned about Sancho and Dulcinea and all the things that we just read about in this class. Uh, and so it arises this question, what is real? What happens whenever other people put us in their realities? These are some of the themes that are kind of explored in this second half of the narrative here. How do we react when we realize we become a story in someone else's words? So... What does that all mean to us in an everyday sense? Have you ever had somebody on social media ever tell a story about you? You know, somebody who was your antagonist who said, look at what so-and-so did to me. Look at what Jimmy Red did to me over here. And you're like, I didn't do that. Yeah, that might have happened to you. Maybe it happened to you, Sean. Yeah. It's like, I didn't do that. And it's like, that's the same thing that's kind of happened to Don Quixote here. Somebody is walking around and saying, this is his story. And he's like, wait a second. Uh, and so I think that that relates to social media world. But also in this day and age, it probably relates to gossip. People were always walking around and saying, look at what so-and-so did. And then you learn this secret and this whole story that's been going on about you, these rumors. And you're like, wait a second, I didn't do all that. 
This is the same kind of thing. What happens when your conception of yourself clashes against what somebody else says about you? Uh, <clears throat> how do our versions of ourselves differ from our own so, uh, differ from other people's conceptions of ourselves. Uh, and it's really fascinating to see how Don Quixote criticizes Cervantes, <laughs> the author of the work, in the book, which is actually Cervantes criticizing himself. Uh, so it's really fascinating to think about that. Uh, <clears throat> so I got enough time to say one more thing before I dismiss class. Uh, and... <clears throat> And in chapter 3, I want you to think about how Don Quixote tries to reconcile himself with these other alternate realities uh, of, that other people are spreading about him. How does he try to reconcile himself with this alternate reality and with the real reality versus his reality? How does he try to reinvent himself in the face of that reality? Uh, <clears throat> all of these things are worth noting. The other things I want you to think about in this part of the narrative uh, is how perhaps Sancho changes as he becomes, he actually is granted a governorship of the island. How does it present Sancho in this part of the narrative versus how he was presented in the first part of the narrative? Whenever he gets what he wants, how does he uh, react? What is his reality like then, and how does that change his conception of himself? And then finally, of course, Don Quixote is going to die at the end. Uh, of course, that's how the novel's got to end, right? That way that Cervantes says nobody else can write another story about Don Quixote because he's dead, right? At, on his deathbed, we're going to see Don Quixote says, well, I was crazy thinking about all this stuff. The real me is Don Quixada right here. And so he, uh, he puts away knight errantry and all of these things at the end. And that's when he dies. It's not until he stops and says that all of this stuff is fake and only the real is real that he finally dies. And so it's really interesting to think about once he stops imagining, that's when his real life comes to an end. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the primary thematic statements of the work as well. Okay, my friends, uh, so what I want you to think going forward is just keep reading, moving forward to Monday, uh, and maybe think about what you want to write about in further detail in relation to both of these books.